All right. Hello, everyone. My name is John Malloy. I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University. Um, I'm also studying for the semester at the University of Glasgow. So um, kind of a dual PhD student right now. And I'm looking at universal life detection as it's revealed by small molecule chemistry. Um, mine's going to be a little high level. And I think if we want to talk about universal life detection, I think we have to start off with what is life. There is a really obvious definition here on Earth. If we see a human, if we see something like this, if we even see a virus, it's very easy to say those things are alive. Like we know it when we see it. Even when it comes to biosignatures, we start seeing, if you see something like highway interchange, or see something like an oxygenated planet with lots of water and green things everywhere, we know that that thing is alive as well. It's very easy to say that thing's not random. This is somehow alive. Where it starts getting a little weird is that we don't know the chemistry. We don't know what a biosignature would look like. Um, for, for on Venus, what does a life, what does a living molecule even look like? If we're on an exoplanet, we have no idea what kind of chemistry is there. We have no idea what kind of um, thermodynamics, what kind of energetic constraints, what kind of energy systems there are. We really have no idea about any of that. And the life that I can introduce at the beginning is this very much Earth biased. We don't have a universal definition of life yet where we can look at something and say, that thing is alive and that thing's not. So part of what I'm trying to do here is to say, here is a system for measuring, chem here's a measurement of chemical systems that says something is alive or something's not. Um, and crucially, it's going to be chemi 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 chemical agnostic. It's going to say, cool, I think that no matter what kind of chemistry we have, whether it's on Venus, whether it's on exoplanet, whatever, where we don't know what kind of chemistry there is, we can still look at the existing systems there and say, regardless of thermodynamic constraints, regardless of energy systems, we're going to define and detect life using whatever chemistry we find. Um, and the way I'm going to do that, this is one proposal, one particular way that I believe has some um, potential interest. Um, I'll explain a few others at the end. Um, it's something called a maximal common substructure algorithm. Um, you know, all, all it does is look at two chemical species. Nothing to do with the environment, nothing to do with anything besides just the two chemical structures. It's a graph-based algorithm. And what it does is takes it converts molecules to graphs. Um, it's done computationally behind the scenes. And it takes the largest common substructure that's shared between those two. So here we have two drugs and this uh, carbon chain with nitrogen, benzene ring, with oxygen attached. Those, that, that, substructure, that substructure is found between both of these two. And it's the largest substructure that is shared between these two compounds. And nothing to do with the chemistry. We, know, we didn't even know where these came from. And that's a good thing. We're able to say, we don't know what is going on here. But there are shared compounds that these have, potentially some kind of shared um, backbone, shared evolutionary chemistry, something like that. And so what I'm doing to kind of say, hey, this is something that we could do, is I'm starting with Earth. Um, starting with Earth, kind of getting a um, picture of what life looks like here on Earth and start comparing it to different sources. Um, because life, as we know, is life here on Earth is the only kind of n equals one way of saying this is what we have for a living system. Um, so what we do here is take all the biochemical compounds from KEG, say a Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. Um, it's one of the standards for small molecule biochemistry. Um, and we're going to take all these molecules, whether they're acetyl-CoA, some lipids, some amino acids, all this stuff, and going to take all about 17,000 of those compounds and put them all through this MCS algorithm. So we're going to pairwise match every single one. Um, ends up being a couple billion pairs, so it takes a while to run. And end up with a lot of 
common substructures. We just return all of those, remove the duplicates because there's a ton of them, and then count how many times each fragment appears in this data set. Um, you're going to end up with a distribution pattern of how often certain um, chemical substructures appear. And then we're going to statistically distinguish those occurrence patterns, see if we can say biochemistry is different than, say, an abiotic data set. Um, what this could potentially look like is something like this, where bio biochemistry has some kind of like shared ev evolutionary, I don't want to use the word evolutionary, some kind of shared chemistry throughout, and some abiotic chemical fragments would be kind of the same throughout an entire data set. So we can say life is different than whatever this abiotic set is. Um, if we see something like this, we could say, cool, there is some evidence that this method could distinguish life from non-life, um, living chemical systems from non-living chemical systems. And you kind of see that, which is, well, biochemistry looks like kind of what we expect. Um, there are very few shared compounds. So a carbon-carbon bond, carbon double bond, benzene ring, those things appear a lot. So they end up, and they are shared almost throughout all of chemistry. I think something like nearly 100% of chemistry has a carbon-carbon bond, unsurprising. But there are very few of those shared chemical substructures. And then there are very many of these kind of complicated substructures. So that, um, that drug-based substructure we found somewhere down here, there's very, very, very few biochemical compounds that have this substructure. So this is very similar to a power law pattern. We see this in other forms of life. So I'm not really going to get into that too much, but this is potentially a distinguishing, distinguishing feature of life. Um, and thank, thankfully, um, the three domains of life, when you start looking at, um, start looking at links between genomes accessed through the Joint Genome Institute, um, and start linking them up with the compounds that those genomes have, be able to say that the three domains of life are pretty similar. So this is able to, one, say life is similar, which is good. If those domains were all over the place, this would be a little hard to distinguish. And my other data set was te technologically produced chemistry. So take data from um, Reaxis, which we have access to um, via the collaboration with the University of Glasgow. And I'm able to say, Reaxis has very, very few shared compounds. It's noted it just drops off precipitously. And there are very many compounds or substructures that are shared throughout. There are very many substructures that are not shared. So see, it's technologically produced chemistry is less shared than biology, um, which, which is interesting. Um, shows that if something has this kind of not shared pattern, um, probably doesn't have this evolutionary history about chemistry does. At least that's my initial hypothesis. Um, it's kind of saying that here is that biochemistry is more shared substructures than a non-living technologically produced system. Um, a few caveats, but Reaxis is primarily a pharmaceutical database. Um, there's a lot of material science and there's a lot of weird metal chemistry going on there, but a significant portion is pharmaceutical based. So it is biochemical adjacent. Um, it's not what's made in biochemistry but just want to make that caveat there. Next steps. Um, the most common substructure algorithm is not the only way we can do this. Um, one of the reasons I am here in Glasgow is to study molecular assembly fragments, which um, there's a paper that just came out um, a few weeks, a few months ago about how um, assembly theory can be used as a potential biosignature. And it's also a preprint, which will um, soon be published in Science Advances of looking at molecular assembly as a way to evolutionary uh, to, to distinguish evolutionarily related compounds. Um, essentially, it makes fragments as well. You're able to break down components, or to break down common chemicals into component fragments. Assembly theory builds them back up. Here, it's looking at the fragments. I'm curious to see how they compare with the MCS algorithms. Any questions on this stuff specifically, let me know. I'm more, very happy to talk about this. Um, the, what I'm trying to say, what I think my goal is, is to say, um, chemically agnostic measures can serve as the basis for identifying these limical, these, these living chemical systems. Um, 
I think you need to have something that's chemically agnostic. I think you're not able to distinguish chemical systems when you're looking only at biochemistry because you get a little, or because you get biased with what earth chemistry has to offer. Um, we won't know what chemistry looks like in other planets. Um, and I think in order to have a full debate about what life is and in order to distinguish life from chemistry, you need to make sure it's a chemically agnostic measure. Um, work with Sarah Walker at Arizona State University. So thank you to her for helping me with this. Um, working with Lee Cronin in Glasgow. Um, certainly been an interesting few weeks so far. Um, and I'm really excited to continue working here. Um, everyone at the Arizona State Lab, everyone that I've met so far in the Cronin group. And also for thank you for the AdGrad, AdGradCon opportunity um, to present here and meet everyone. Um, it's a wonderful conference and I'm always having a lot of fun. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to hearing what you have to say.